So in the VC world, there are two kinds of people. There are limited partners and there are general partners. General partners basically refers to us, right? We are the people who are actually investing the money. And limited partners are uh, people who actually give us the money to invest. They are, uh, so who are these limited partners? Typically, in the US, they are uh, public pension funds, private funds. Uh, for example, there's a fund called CalPERS, which is uh, the, the California Public Employee uh, Retirement Plan. And they have $300 billion in management, of which they allocate a very small part, let's say 10, 15 million, to venture capital and private equity. And some of that makes its way down to Asia, and some comes to India, and so on. Right? So uh, you have all of these big global uh, uh, provident funds, you have retirement funds, university endowments, uh, who, who typically invest uh, in, in venture capital. Harvard is the largest university endowment in the US. They have 32 billion under management. So endowment means people are just giving, you know, writing a check back to their alma mater or they're making donations, right? And they invest those things. Uh, there are also family offices, uh, you know, high net worth individuals, both in the US and in India, right? They are now opening up to venture capital as an asset class and, and so on. Right? So what happens is limited partners put money into this fund and we put some money as well. Okay, and I'll just uh, show you the breakup. But any questions on this slide? Right? Makes sense? LPs, GPs put money together and we create a venture capital fund. And so how is this set up? So typically these LPs, these limited partners, these very rich people with a lot of money, they invest uh, somewhere between uh, 96 to 99 percent of the fund, right? Uh, so most of the money comes from them. And we invest somewhere between one to four percent. Okay? And all the money gets pooled together. And the fund life for a typical VC fund is uh, eight to 10 years, right? So it is a very illiquid asset class. So once you put the money, you, you don't get anything back for 10 years, right? I mean, you, you may be getting some as we start finding exits, but typically you have to have a long, uh, it's a 10 year horizon. Uh, you have to wait for a long period of time for the returns. Normally what we do is once we raise the money, so we've raised uh, 200, 207 million dollars, you're typically deploying a lot of that capital in the first three years, right? So in the first three years, we're making investments in startups. And I'll, I'll talk about how we decide which startup to, to pick, right? But the first three years we're, we're investing, after that, uh, and so typically half the fund is deployed pretty much in those first three years, right? Um, so then the, um, the next three years, we're working to help grow the company and make sure they have follow-on funding. And we've reserved the other half of the fund for the follow-on round. So we will put more money into the companies. Because this is, again, a, a, a game where uh, you want to own a large part of the winners. And so you try to invest in the subsequent rounds as well. And uh, typically in the year seven to 10, you're trying to find them exits. Right? An exit is typically when there's an IPO or an M&A. Right? Uh, sometimes we'll have a secondary, another fund come in and buy us out. That happens as well. So typically this stuff happens, um, usually in the year seven to 10 is when you're returning the fund. And then like I said, most VCs have overlapping funds. So at any point in time, we are trying to exit a fund, we are in the growth phase of a second fund, and we're investing from the third fund. And they just stagger back and forth. Okay? So what happens at the end? So at the end, um, first of all, the capital has to be returned back to the LPs first. Right? That's the first thing we do. So if you took 100 million back, 100 million, you have to give the 100 million back. Right? Only then after that, the profits starts uh, to get shared. And the profit share is 80-20. Okay, so 80% goes to the LPs, 20% comes to the GPs, which is us. Okay? So as an example, if you raised a $100 million fund, let's say we did some great investments, invested in Flipkart, you know, Mintra, et cetera. The fund became, let's say, $300 million. 100 million was what we deployed first. That has to be returned. So when we have an exit, we return capital back. Then the remaining 200 million is split Right, 80, 20. So we'll have 40 million and uh, 160 to the other guys. So what I want to do is um, actually wanted to spend some time now talking about how we evaluate startups, and actually put a picture of uh, Sand Hill Road. Uh, how many of you guys know Sand Hill Road? Anyone's been there? No one's been there. <laughs> okay, so Sand Hill Road is in Menlo Park, California. It's one street where 
all the big VCs in the US are, right? And so if you're in California, or if you're, if you're a startup in the US, you make kind of a daily trip there to pitch to VCs. And that's where Sequoia is, you know, Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, and that's where you know, Google was funded, Cisco, Amazon, Intel. Literally all, all these companies were venture capital funded at some point. Right? And they became really big companies and returned lots of money to their investors. And so uh, there is this thing of you know, when you drive down Sandal Road, you take this exit. Uh, and the entrepreneurs are thinking, OK, how is the VC going to evaluate me? Right? And I thought today I would give all of you a sneak peek into just what is our decision-making process. Right? Why do we make the decisions we do? So um, this, I think, is going to your question. Somebody here had a question of uh, what happens to these companies if they don't do well. Right? So first of all, so venture capital is, uh, like a lot of things, is governed by something called the power law. Okay? So in nature, there is a power law, which is that for every Mount Everest, which is 29,000 feet, there are 10 other mountains that are you know, 20,000 feet. And for every one of those 20,000 foot mountains, there are 10,000 10, foot mountains and so on, right? And so same thing with trees, right? You have a 300 meter tree, there are 10, 200 meter trees and so on. It's the same thing in venture capital in, in math as well, that you have uh, this, this law, uh, exponential law. And what happens here is that uh, this is actually a chart from uh, correlation ventures. And it's, uh, it's looking at US numbers. What it says is that of all the venture capital funded companies, I think they looked at 21,000, 65% returns zero to one X after 10 years, right? 65% of companies pretty much die, right? Most of them die in the first 18 months. This is after the VC put money into those companies. Okay, another 25% returned one to five X, right? And again, this is not adjusted for time value of money. So after, just imagine after 10 years, you're getting a two X return, right? It's not that great. So, Inherently, this is a game where um, it is a game of home runs. Okay? Only 10% of companies over here return more than, than 5x, 5 to 10x. And that's when the numbers start looking meaningful for, for the VC. And really, you have a very small one that returns 50x plus. Do you guys know, just in, in venture capital world, which company returned the most money to the investors? Any guesses? eBay? Alibaba was not venture funded, so yeah. So from a VC perspective, Facebook was yeah. So there's one that was even better than Facebook. WhatsApp, yeah, absolutely. So WhatsApp returned supposedly, I think, 150x or something like that, right? Which is uh, just amazing returns. And and so Sequoia was one of the the main investment in WhatsApp, and Facebook was also very very um, you know Axel was the early investor in Facebook, and they had a very high return. So uh, really, venture capital is a game of, of home runs. Okay? It's a game of finding these outliers and staying with them through the journey. And the fact is that we can actually afford, as long as you have these, you can afford for a lot of these to happen. You can afford for a lot of companies to, to, uh, um, to die. Okay? And which is why um, you know, there's this thing in the, in the Silicon Valley about you fail fast. Right? You start a company, you're, you raise money, you try hard to find a product market fit or a product problem fit, and if it doesn't work, you just shut it down and start the next company. And that's a very accepted, uh, both by VCs and by entrepreneurs, very accepted in the valley. In India, we are getting there. Right? Ten years ago, if you told your dad or mom that, hey, I'm starting a startup and uh, shut down kar now, right? I'm going to go to some other company, right? they, would have a, they would have a shock. Right? Today, it's a lot more accepted. That's fine. Right? Okay. So very important, I just want you guys to all understand this, right? Venture capital is a game of, of outliers. It's a game of outsized returns in, a very, in very, very few companies, right? less than 1x. Yes, so the question is, is it sunk? And yes, so the, the typically a VC will write down their investment, right? Just like how if you're a mutual fund, every, every uh, quarter, whenever you publish reports, you actually will, will mark to market your... your um, the value of the investments, VCs do that as well. And companies that we think are not doing well, we will actually mark them down, either down to zero or you know, 0.5 of what we invested, so on. But there has to be the US and trying to invest. Yeah. So cost of the, many of the companies are failed, many startups are failed. Why they have failed? Yeah. Um, 
It's a good question. So why did these companies fail, right? Yeah. So just hold that thought for. Um, um, so uh, just hold that thought for one more slide. I'll, I'll give you some interesting data. So uh, just very quickly, startup financing cycle. I'm, I assume most of you guys understand how this works, right? Um, just going to stand over here. This stage here is very, very early stage uh, angels and seed capital, right? And this is what we call the valley of death. This is where we're saying a lot of companies die right here. Then there is uh, the stage of Series A and Series B. This is our core, uh, our core focus areas. And it is still risk capital because the companies, uh, there's still a very high risk right, that they may not be able to find the product market fit. And then from C onwards over here, this is growth capital where the risk level has gone down, but also the, you know, the, the J, J curve starts flattening out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I don't have. Yeah. So it's a great uh, question. What do all these stages mean from the life cycle of a startup? And I actually had a slide which I removed because I thought there was too much of data. Uh, the conventional wisdom. I'm just giving you guys the conventional thought process. In seed, this stage. What you're doing is you're trying to, the metric is that there are some people using the product and there has been some growth month on month. Right? Just people are using it. Uh, you built a product, people are using it. There's uh, maybe a little bit of revenue, right? A very, very small percentage are paying, but some are using. And in, in this stage, really what you're doing is you're trying to find the product problem fit, okay? Where you're saying, is there really a problem? And do I have the right product uh, or am I building the right product? In this stage here, what we call the early stage, um, you have found the product problem fit. Okay, and now you're looking for product market fit, which is what will people pay me for, right? What is the right? So you know you're solving the right problem. You're now saying, how am I going to get paid for it? And um, in this stage, typically we're saying there are, um, in Series A, we typically say, um, Many people using, some people paying. And in Series B, many people using, many people paying. Okay, so that's just, I know these are not quantitative terms, but typically you'll start, you start seeing month on month metrics. There is rapid growth in usage metrics. So this is actually not intended to show revenue. It's actually intended to show usage on their way down, right? or they've come down. Where do they go from here? Right? And um, unfortunately, you know, this obviously do, does happen in our industry. That, you know, it is so difficult to, to build a successful company, right? It's just very, very difficult. Uh, a lot of stars have to align. And uh, typically, a company like this will end up um, trying to get uh, their unit economics in order, right? Which means that they're going to try to get profitable. And I will, um, I'll come to that. I know a lot of people had asked me this before the meeting. Uh, do we care about revenue or do you care about profit, right? And I'll just address that in a bit. But generally, most companies are focused on the top line, they're focused on revenue. If things start going downhill, you're not able to raise more money, then you start focusing on, on profit. And if they can get to profitability and sustainability, they can turn it around and raise more money, right? And we've seen that, when Flipkart did that too, right? Flipkart's valuation was uh, publicly, public numbers, right? 15 billion was uh, the round two years back, and the most recent round is 11, uh, 13 billion or something with SoftBank, right? whatever they publicly stated. So if you look at those numbers, um, what happened between those was that Flipkart turned around. Right? They turned happens to those startups. So, uh, and again, this goes back to how we evaluate startups, right? So what is an ideal startup for us? Right? What is the ideal company for uh, a VC? Uh, there are three or four characteristics that are very common. The first one, almost every single VC will tell you this, right? that it is driven by a passionate, dynamic, very, very smart set of, of founders, okay? They're people who can really control the narrative. They've really thought through the, the problem. They, they typically have all the answers. When they come into the meeting, right, every question you, you ask them, they know the answers, right? They may tell you, you know, I haven't thought about it, but here's what I'm gonna do about it. But typically they've thought through, and it all starts with the team, okay? So, VCs are, you, know, you may have heard this, it's a cliche. VCs are backing the team. You're backing the team before you back the market and the product. Okay? 
So it's a very passionate, driven entrepreneur. They're serving an unmet need in a growing market. Okay? And again, this now comes back to why do startups die? Okay? So 65% of startups die because of one thing. Right? The product that they're building, nobody wants it. Okay? Or a very small number of people want it. And it's very hard, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you have an idea, you build a product, you spend, you know, you're, you're, it's a blood, sweat, and tears in it. It's very hard to admit that, you know what, nobody wants it. But this is the biggest reason why startups die. A lot of entrepreneurs will say, I, I had to shut it down because I couldn't raise money, right? And couldn't raise money is because, right, nobody wanted your product, right? You were not able to sell it, right? So, um, and conversely, those who are able to sell, right, who are able to pitch, who are able to really, it's not the best product that wins. It's somebody who can actually go sell the product, get customers. And you see that in the metrics at their educational background, right? Um, now, um, again, I'm going to give a slightly long answer. The fact is that in venture capital and uh, in this world, um, even in the U.S. and in, in India, a lot of founders do come from an IIT or an IIM or in the US it's Stanford, Wharton, you know, all of the big names, right? Uh, what we don't know is, was it, is it causation, right? Because they went to Stanford, they started a great school or is that just, you know, they only got and came into a VC because they went to Stanford, right? So we don't know that yet. Um, but uh, the fact is that we, uh, at least for me as a VC, uh, I tend to look at a variety of things when I'm talking to the founder. Uh, I think the educational background is relatively less important for me, right? A lot of it is, uh, you know, just their grasp of the problem, how well they're able to articulate it, how well they're able to explain their solution. And like I said, they typically have all the answers, right? The best founders have an answer for everything you're giving them. It may change, right? the answer may change a month from now as they learn more, but they have already thought through a lot of things before you have thought about them. And um, there's also something that we call uh, entrepreneur, founder, uh, VC chemistry, right? So there has to be, you know, there are certain times you just realize that this is, you know, we're going to be able to work together and build a great company together. And there are other cases where even if the founder is very good, just the, the chemistry is not there. Right? So to me personally, I think the college thing is less important. But having said that, uh, statistics show that uh, a lot of the top unicorns are one of the factors is that the, the guys went to Stanford or some of the top schools in the U.S. and the same thing in India. Yeah. So every VC is different. So, so the question is, how do we actually mentor and work with these companies? Right? And uh, again, this it really depends on the company, depends on the VC, depends on the entrepreneur. Um, some VCs tend, uh, you know, just my my own personal style is that there are certain things that I have experience in, right? I have, a re uh, I used to work in the Silicon Valley, so I have a reasonably decent Rolodex of contacts, right? I can pick up the phone, call someone, make connections for the startup. But I have never written a, a piece of software code in my life, right? I've done chips, but I've never done software. So I'm not going to be able to advise the entrepreneur on, on operations or technology, but I can definitely advise uh, him or her on, on fundraising, on growing the business, on sales, you know, strategy, right? And so I tend to focus my efforts on that. And hopefully the board that the entrepreneur has is uh, reasonably diverse, that there are different people with different skill sets. Uh, another area that we tend to work on a lot is, uh, is hiring. Right? So we will actually interview. We try to source candidates for our startups. We actually will interview uh, anyone who is a CXO level hire or a VP level hire. We will actually interview them as well. Um, and all of these are just you know, what we call value-added uh, services for our startups. Because the fact is that once you put money in, after that you're joined at the hip, right? Both of you have to build a successful business. But the fact is that uh, it's very important to understand that a VC is not the entrepreneur, right? VC will never run the company, right? All we can do is is help where help is needed, right? It is the, the, the reason we invest in this company is because of the, the founders. It's their job to grow the business. So um, I'll just come to that. So uh, just give me a second. So how important is the problem, right? So uh, if you look at the characteristics of a classic IDG Ventures funded team, right? Um, the first thing, the IDG uh, funded startup, the first thing is we're looking for a strong, passionate, driven CEO. So first of all, the founding team has to be very strong. Within the founding team, it's the CEO has to be 
a very strong leader. Uh, you want founders with diverse skill sets, and like I said, really have a deep understanding of the problem. Now, once you go past, once you've said, okay, this is, this is there, then you start thinking about the next set of, of, of questions, right? Which is, for us, the market, and for me personally, the market is more important than the product itself, right? And the reason is that uh, there are a lot of markets where I mean, you could be the, you may have, you may be the only person in that market, but if the market isn't big enough, then you will not be able to build a very large business. And if you can't build a large business, then that business is not venture fundable. Right? A VC cannot put money in that business. There's nothing wrong with. You know, for example, you could run a chain of restaurants, right? And uh, it's a great business, right? You could um, have multiple uh, restaurants in the same city with the same brand name, but a VC is not in that business. A VC cannot invest in that business because for, for that business, the market size and the amount of work that you have to do to deploy that business, you cannot get this hockey stick growth, right? Without having um, significant amount of uh, investment. So venture capital is in the game of non-linear growth, right? You want the metri output metrics to look like this, but the input cost to grow linearly, okay? And the only way you can do that is through technology. So we're looking at the market, and then we come to the product, right? And your question was, um, hey, you know, you can only, uh, isn't the product important? And the fact is that the product is important, right? It is important that when we invest, uh, we understand a little bit that there is uh, they have to be doing one thing that is much better than the competition, right? There's one thing that has to be really, really good. They don't have to be good on all their metrics, right? But the one very, very important thing, you know, the, the thesis is 10x faster, 10x better, 10x cheaper, right? One of those three you have to be doing compared to the incumbents who started. Mitra was doing uh, customized gifting, right? So you could actually take a mug and put your name on it or something, right? And they would sell that to you. And they kind of quickly realized, I think, over the course of a year, year and a half, that this is not the right business, right? It's hard to monetize it. It's hard to scale it, really. And so then they pivoted towards a fashion marketplace. And then, you know, the, it just took off from there. So, uh, yes, the board is involved. Yes, we, you know, we, we look at the metrics every quarter that you have board meetings. But usually, the pivots come from the entrepreneur, right? The, the CEO comes in and says, you know, what, what I'm doing is not right. I want to, we're good? Okay. So I just wanted to, uh, since we're talking about uh, Mintra and about, uh, I just want to give you guys uh, some thoughts on why did we invest in some of these companies, right? So Mintra, I gave the example, it was your backing Mukesh Bansal, right? That was what it came down to. And uh, because when he came in, he didn't have some of those numbers, but the market was very, very big, right? We knew, I mean, everyone knows that there was a big market even at that point. And whether he would be able to capture the market with the product or the idea that he had was a different, you know, that's, that's fine. That's what you're trying to back. Uh, that's what they do with the money, right? But the market is big, and the entrepreneur is very, very strong. And so kind of some of those checkboxes happen. And to date, I think that's really been one of our best, uh, best investments. The one which is a lot more, you know, new age, both these companies, Active.ai and Sictuple. So Active.ai is a company that just started in, um, I think, in May last year. Okay. And what they do is that uh, very soon, if you open up, if any of you guys have Access Bank, you guys bank with Access Bank in India? Yeah, it's some Two or three guys, yeah. So if you have money in Access Bank, you can actually open up the Access Bank app. You'll see a chat bot, and I can say, uh, hey, send 1,000 rupees to Umang. Right? And it figures out who is Umang, what is 1,000 rupees. And it's all done through NLP. There's no human on the other side. And what they've done is they also integrated with the back-end uh, core banking system to execute the transaction. And, you know, winning banks is extremely hard. This company is not looking at India. They've, they've won. They're looking at the international market. Um, based, it started here. They're going to move to the U.S. Uh, now, Active.ai, so the question, why did, we bank, why did we back these guys, right? When they walked into our office, uh, the first meeting, literally it was the three star entrepreneurs you know, again, they just, it was just wow, right? These guys, they knew what they were doing. They had all come from the banking domain, right? So one of them, the CEO was one of the early founders of Yes Bank. And before that, he had worked at HDFC. He knew banking inside out. He knew how to sell. The other founder was an AI NLP expert. And a third guy was someone who had built products for 
uh, in Singapore for the fintech sector. Actually, the moment they walked in, right, their story was so, it all came together. They knew their stuff, and they convinced us that, look, I'm not in so-and-so bank yet, but give me two months, I'll be there. And when I'm there, this is what the numbers are going to look like. Right? And they have delivered, right? which is why they raised the follow-on round as well. So this was a, a big leap of faith for us. right? They didn't have any of the metrics, but we backed them purely. The team was very strong, and the reference checks that we did on the team. So we will call up their past employers talk, you know, in the early days. Very, very strong. Okay? Now, Sictupul, which is the other company that we backed, this is very interesting. This is, in some ways, a moonshot. Okay? What we're doing here is Sictupul is trying to solve the holy grail of, uh, of medicine which is uh, automatic disease diagnosis, right? So today, just imagine, right, if you have uh, any medical condition, you have malaria, you have uh, all the way up to blood cancer, right? There are multiple tests that you have to do to go to hospitals. And what these guys are doing is they have a device, um, and more importantly, they have an algorithm. It's an image recognition algorithm that they have trained over, over time that can actually look at your blood sample and say, look, you know, you may have dengue or you may have um, uh, blood cancer, or you may have XYZ. Right? And what this device does, it is extremely hard to do. Right? Even a trained pathologist makes a lot of errors. So for an algorithm to do this is amazing. And if, and if you can do this, just think, India has uh, the lowest penetration of, of healthcare uh, per capita. Right? There's, I think, 1,500. Um, there's one um, doctor for every... 1,50,000 people or some insane number like that. And in most rural areas, there's no uh, lab. So if you want, if, if you suspect you have something, you have to actually send the sample to a city. And this device can actually do it instantaneously. Right? Now, it's a moonshot. The reason, why is it a moonshot? Because the fact is that it's a binary outcome. Right? If, if they succeed, they will revolutionize healthcare. If they don't, then it's nothing. Right? They don't, there's no, no one's going to buy their, the company for the, the people. So these are moonshots, and again, when they came in, what we were very excited about, they actually demoed their early uh, product to us, and it was very, very impressive, right? So this is a case where we saw the product, we saw, because they'd already built it. So I'm just going to leave you with this one other thought that, um, you know, 20 years ago, when I first moved into the, the, the tech world, um, if you had an idea, what you do is you first write a business plan. You write a business plan, get all this stuff done, and then you go pitch it to a VC. Today, it's like that. Today, when you have an idea, what's the first thing you do? You start, yeah, you start building a prototype. You start coding it, right? You start doing it. And you build the first MVP, minimum viable product, MVP, right? And then you start, people start using it. You start getting customer feedback. You tweak the product. And at some point, then you go to a VC saying, look, I already have, I have an idea. There's a gap in the market. And look, I already have a product. And look, this is the month-on-month -month growth. Right? And that is what these guys had. They had a product, and it looked, you know, even though it was still in very early days, the accuracy of the image. So I'm just going to very quickly talk about India. I just have two or three more slides. I just want to tell you what we are excited about in India. So um, in India, I just want to show you venture capital. So what happened was 2015 was a crazy year. And um, it was, uh, in many ways, a bubble, right? And we all, everyone knew it was a bubble. There was, uh, I think, $8 billion. Uh, if I remember the math, I think there was a, this is just showing venture capital. Private equity money, there was, uh, I think, $14 billion. $16 billion was totally invested that year in what we call startups, right? Flipkart, um, you know, uh, uh, Ola Cabs, soft, soft, uh, Snapdeal, et cetera, et cetera, raised money. And after that, the, there was a correction. Um, it all started with, uh, so Morgan Stanley wrote down the value of Flipkart in February of 2016. And Morgan Stanley is a publicly traded, uh, it's not a publicly traded mutual fund, but they have to file papers. And somewhere in the paper, they had shown that they had written it down. And that caused a, f a slew of uh, subsequent events. Because you know, if the market leader is written down, then everyone else has to come down. and. And that caused a lot you know, of things where we are. The market has slowed down. Now, the good thing is uh, that 2017 is much better than 2016 from a startup perspective. Okay? More startups are being funded. 
And um, the good news is this, okay, that in the last two years, uh, these numbers are not perfectly accurate, but in the last two years, every one of the top seven VCs has raised a large fund. Okay? Uh, and we all have dry powder that is there to deploy. Uh, yes, we have all become cautious. We are more careful in the companies that we're picking. It's not the Wild West like it was in 2015, but uh, there are a lot of deals happening. Okay, so this year alone, we have, I think, invested in, we've, I think, done 10 deals this year already. Okay. So um, the good news is that if you're an entrepreneur, you want, to, you want to go to a VC, you're thinking of starting a company, VCs have raised money. Right? So cash, capital is not drying up, but the bar has gone up. Okay. There's still, you know, the consumer market is still up for grabs, right? In some ways, we're still getting started. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have read uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, annual report. So Jeff Bezos, it's very interesting. You must read this. Every year, Jeff Bezos writes a shareholder letter. And every year, it starts with the same thing. It says, today is day zero or day one for the internet, and today is day one for Amazon.com. Right? We're just getting started. Right? And in some ways, you could argue that is the case for India. You know, a lot of stuff has happened. A lot of water has flown under, under the bridge. You know, we have Amazon. We have Flipkart. Uh, but it is still, in many ways, day, one, day zero, day one. There are many, many, many sectors that are still up for grabs. Um, you know, the total, just take e-commerce, right? India, um, I think, will be a, um, um, in, in 2020, uh, India is going to be a trillion-dollar e-commerce market. And even in that time frame, we think e-commerce will only be $150 billion, right, five years from now. Today, it's only 12 billion or 14 billion. So even in the US, right, uh, 20 years after Amazon.com showed up, e-commerce is still only 13, 14% of, of all US retail, right? 90, sorry, 86% is still, still bought in stores, right? So it's a long ways to go even in the US. So India is much further behind. So there are a lot of opportunities. There's uh, major issues that we have today in healthcare, you know, doctor to patient ratio. Education is a big problem in India. Um, at the same time, you know, lending, a lot of things are happening, smartphones. Uh, you guys know the story. I'm not going to repeat all of that. Uh, you know, uh, people are now able to access loans. There is India Stack that gives you immediate authentication. So uh, it's exciting times. I want to show you what it is that we are excited about. Okay. So first of all, um, on the consumer side, I think, I think this is my last slide, Mangan. So I'll just tell you what we, uh, as a VC, are looking for in the next couple of years. And you could say more or less most VCs are in this space. So, and I'll also tell you what we are not looking for, which is the antithesis. Right? First of all, on the consumer side, um, we, are, uh, we have definitely moved from e-commerce to the sharing economy. Right? And this has happened, you know, it's a global phenomena. We recently invested in Flyrobe. Right? How many of you guys have used Flyrobe? Flyrobe, Fly yeah. The apparel, yeah, rentals, yeah, yeah. And so Flyrobe is just an amazing company. There's also a, a very, there's Rent the Runway in the U.S. So, you know, you have a party coming up this weekend, right? Why go and buy a dress? Just go rent it from Flyrobe. Shows up, it's dry clean. You use it and you send it back the next day. Uh, we're also looking at B2B commerce. So while the B2C stories, uh, you know, the hor large horizontal companies have become big, in the B2B space, it's still very early. And we're looking at, and this is a space of vertical-specific markets. So we are investors in a company called Bizongo, which does uh, B2B in the plastics and packaging space. Okay, so looking at that. Uh, we also think uh, we are one of the few venture firms that also still looks at media. Right? Globally, media has gone through a very tough time. Right? Um, you guys all know that thing. You know, Google, Facebook are make all the money. Right? New York Times and all these guys don't make any money. So... Uh, but we are, uh, India is still very early. It's one of the few places where print subscriptions are actually still growing up, still going up, right? And we think there's still a big opportunity in vernacular media, right? Um, one of the companies that I think we all feel that we missed is, uh, is Daily Hunt, right? News Hunt, which is today at about 25 million monthly active users, right? Which is just amazing. All vernacular language media. So a very large part of India does not consume English language content. And so we're looking at that space. In finance, very quickly, you know, we touched upon lending, right? So both business lending and consumer lending. 
We think it is a very large untapped market. We are investors in a company called Early Salary that actually gives um, uh, you know, loans a few days before you get your, your salary. And uh, so very short-term loans that you then pay back in a short period of time. We are looking at the robo-advisory space very closely. Um, you know, in the U.S., you have uh, Betterment. Um, there's also a company called Motif, which gives you thematic investments. So there's basically an algorithm that's investing on your behalf, right? You just give them money, and hopefully you get a lot of money back. <laughs> uh, so we're looking at that, those kind of things in India. Uh, insurance, like I said, we invested in Policy Bazaar, which is one of the uh, fastest uh, growing new age companies. One area we're looking at actively is, is global SaaS, right? So this is Indian companies that are going after the global market. And it's very, it's very interesting. You know, there's a strong dichotomy. You, you have an Indian company, either you look at the India market or you're looking at the global market. There's uh, very little overlap, right? Because the global market dynamics, typically it's a B2B company, very hard, uh, very different dynamics. Indian businesses just don't pay, right? And so you inherently start focusing on the global market. And one last thing, I'm just quickly talking about uh, an area which I personally look at in IDG Ventures. I look at frontier technologies. And frontier tech is all of these new age areas, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, augmented reality. How many of you guys own some form of cryptocurrency or Bitcoin? Just one? Man. <laughs> so you must be happy. Bitcoin hit $10,000, right? Um, yeah, so uh, crypto is, is the new, this is, you know, my theory has been for a while that blockchain is internet 3.0, right? This is the plumbing for the next internet. And over the next few years, the next Google, the next Facebook will come out of this, right? A lot of the companies will die who are there today, but the next big guys will be born. Okay? We also have an antithesis, what we don't look at. So we don't invest in services companies like, you know, the next Infosys or the next Wipro, right? That ship has sailed a long time ago. We also, uh, we haven't been looking at ad tech or HR tech. And uh, we also don't look at hardware as a fund. Okay. Yeah, so the question is, why don't we look at edtech? Yeah. And edtech is a bit of a dilemma because area where it could, maybe it's a nonprofit that should invest in these companies. Right? So I'm just going to, I know I'm out of time, guys. I just wanted to leave you with this thought that, you know, um, there's 7x billion people in the world, right? Um, you know, 6 billion people are, live in circumstances very similar to India. And the fact is that if you can innovate, if you are a startup, you're building something for the India market, and you're able to succeed, which is very hard right, to do uh, because the market is so uh, fragmented and very the ability to pay is very, very less, you can actually sell that product in all emerging markets. Okay? So uh, that is all I had. I think we have a few minutes for Q&A. Do we? What's my take on udan.com B2B? Yeah. So again, I don't know anything specific about Udan that much, but uh, B2B in general is a very hot opportunity. Look at China, 